Good morning everyone. So we're going over the Scourge of World vs. World build today. And I don't think I have the right stuff on. Give me one sec. So here we have your traits. And the reasoning behind them is uh, bleeding on crit. You're running crit, so might as well get a little extra bleeding out of it. Also an increase in duration. The damage is pretty low, but still useful to have as a cover condition. Plague sending. Uh, the way this works is whenever you press your F5 for Shroud, it transfers two conditions on you to each of the targets that it hits. So whenever you fire that off, if you have ten conditions on you, you hit five people with it, all ten conditions get sent to those five people instead. Uh, Fury when entering Shroud, again, just to help with Burst. Path of Corruption, another really strong skill. So. This makes your F2, which is on a six and a half second cooldown, uh, convert two boons into conditions on each affected target. Which means that if you can land an F1 quickly followed by F2 and F4, you're going to corrupt one, two, three, and then likely be able to get a fear off because you're probably going to get stability or resistance or both. Um, target the weak, another big one here. So you're Precision is converted into condition damage at 13%, which is okay. We, we run a little bit of condition, or a little bit of precision in our build. And the critical chance increase of 2% per condition, also very strong. Um, a lot of the time in World vs. World, people have resistance up and they're, they're sitting on 8, 10 conditions. So the whole time you're getting an extra 16 to 20% crit chance. Combined with the 77% uh, critical damage, it makes for a significant boost. And then Parasitic Contagion is just to help you heal. Okay, so here's your Soul Reaping line. The uh, best things about it are going to be your Gluttony, which gains an extra 10% life force uh, per any skill that gains a life force. So your Soul Marks, which gain 3%, are actually going to gain 3.3. Uh, if you're running Axe, it's going to gain, instead of 12%, it'll gain, um, I don't know, what is it, 13.2%. Uh, if you're running Scepter, your Scepter 3 is going to gain you 8.8 uh, .8 plus 1.1 1 .1 per condition up to a 5 condition maximum, um, which is going to be 14.3% total. Um, just a nice nice thing to have, and it comes for free, so great. Uh, Soul Marks, which make your staff skills unblockable and give you life force per each. Uh, we'll go into why that's important when we talk about the staff. Last Grasp, your Spectral Armor, um, whenever you're hit under 50%, so if you get caught inside of a bomb, it breaks you uh, out of a stun, grants you a bunch of life force every second because you're going to keep getting hit, gives you protection so you take less damage. This is kind of great, so if you get hit with a bomb, it gives you a chance to dodge roll out of it. Vital Persistence, 20% recharge on all your F skills um, and extra vitality. Extra vitality is always nice. 20% recharge on these is huge. Uh, more and more of these that you can use, the more damage you can do, the more healing you can do. This is the whole purpose of the class right here. Your weapon skills are kind of trash on Scourge, but those are fantastic. Uh, strength of Undeath, giving you an extra uh, life force boost as well as a little bit of extra damage, which is really great because the more life force you have, uh, the larger your pool is, the more that your life force skills give you. Each of these uh, life force granting skills are based on a percentage of your total life force, which is boosted up by vitality. So the more life force you have to start with, the more that each of these life force giving skills gives you, because it's working from a larger uh, base pool to begin with. Um, and dumb fire, which is amazing. So this is uh, burning on each target affected by any of your shade skills. If you hit F1 and then roll your fingers from F1 to 2, 3, 4, and 5, it will drop 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, sta uh, five stacks of burning on each target affected. Um, really great for bursts. It does a lot of damage very quickly. Skills, your shades, and your torch. Uh, the first skill we take is Abrasive Grit because every time that you use a barrier, it's going to remove one condition from each ally affected and give them two might. Um, Notably, that means that your F3, your heal skill, and portal if you run it, or if you're going to run Serpent Siphon, then Serpent Siphon as well. will give you one condition removed on each ally affected by it. While it's not great, 
it's kind of the best option that we have. The other ones that we can use here are Fell Beacon, which give you expertise based on condition damage, which isn't bad, as well as a recharge reduction on your torch. So that's kind of the other option to go with. Um, or a Nourishing Rot, which is completely worthless for World vs. World. You're going to gain more life force than you're ever going to use uh, just playing in a Zerg. So this is kind of the, the worst pick for, for this game mode. Um, Abrasive Crit is the one we choose just because it helps out with the uh, condition clearing in, in our groups. Um, we got Sand Sage here, which gives you plus 75 and 75, which equates to 5% and 5% boon duration and condition duration per shade. Um, and Unending Corruption, which gives you a boon converted to a condition on every F1. So whenever you hit somebody or hit a group with F1, it's going to convert a boon on each person affected. Other options are Sadistic Searing, which uh, decreases the cooldowns of all of your punishment skills by 20%, which is nice because we're running four, four punishments, uh, so that's, that's pretty big. And Burning, um, every time that you use one of these skills, your next F1 is going to cause Burning, which can be, again, really nice for a burst combo. If you're going to press uh, your heal skill immediately afterwards, you can follow it with an F1, and then roll your fingers from F1 to F2 to F4. Um, and what that'll do is it'll drop one stack of burning from Sadistic Searing, two, three, four stacks of burning, as well as uh, removing two of their boons and possibly getting a fear into them as well. Um, Desert Empowerment is great for if you're running a Support Scourge, if you're running Minstrels or Apothecary, uh, because that combined with this means that every time you drop your F1, you're going to remove a condition from everybody affected and you give them a nice hefty barrier. With, he uh, with healing power, you can actually drop like 6k barrier on some uh, a group of people every 6.5 seconds. Um, you would run F1, F2, F3, and remove one uh, condition due to barrier, remove two conditions from this for a total of three, and remove a fourth condition here from, again, barrier. So not only do they get a four condition clear every 6 seconds, but it also gives them a 6k barrier, which is, is really nice on a push. Uh, Sans Savant is kind of the move for Zerg play. Um, not only does it mean that each of your traits are counted as having three shades, so this is tripled and this is also tripled for a total of 15% boon duration and condition duration, but 15% damage reduced for the Scourge. Um, makes you a lot tankier, makes you a lot more able to deal damage. Um, and since it also re uh, reduces the recharge to 10 seconds, you'll always have that up. So every time that you're in combat, you'll always have up that 10 percent or that 15% uh, of reduced damage and outgoing boon and condition durations. The other nice thing about it is an increased target cap from three to five, which is a 66% increase. So that means that instead of affecting three people, you're going to hit five not only around your shade but also around the scourge. That means that your defensive skills are also 66% stronger than if you were not using Shanshavon. Um, as well as having an increased radius. It goes from being 180 up to a 360, which we can see here. So that's, that's the radius on your Sans Savant. If you're not running Sans Savant, it's only that big. And that effect is both around the Shade and around the Scourge. So pretty, pretty big, right? Um, Demonic Lore is great if you're going to be in PvE. But the extra burning every three seconds, the only ways that you have to apply Torment in a Zerg play usually is going to be your F1. And if you're dropping that on somebody, they're already going to get the Torment. So you can, you can run your fingers over these skills, but you're not going to give them extra burning unless they're sitting in your shade for more than three seconds, which is not likely in a Zerg play. They're going to keep moving around you. Um, this can be useful if you're running Scepter and Torch, because uh, between those you have three extra applications of Torment. So you're getting an extra three burns um, per the cooldown on your on your scepter and torch skills, but that's not really worth it compared to the extra two targets on Sansevant. So you're going to be putting out more burning on that than you will be using this. So now we're going to take a look at your staff skills. Um, your F1 gives you five, uh, four percent life force per target hit, and it pierces. Um, it can be reflected. It can be blocked. It can be you know, whatever, but the damage on it's not that high, so it doesn't really matter if you get hit back with it. If you fire it into a Zerg, however, 
you're almost always going to hit five targets in that 1200 range, which means that you're almost always going to get 20% life force every time that you cast this, which is huge. You know, that's that's a giant chunk of your bar. Um, this is kind of your main life force generator whenever you really need life force or whenever this uh, fight is starting off. Your two and three skills are both kind of fillers. These are nice to have. Three is great if someone's running away because it chills and poisons them, which uh, stops them from getting away quickly and stops them from healing. Um, this is really bad, but uh, it's it's a nice filler, you know. Um, Putrid Mark is your biggest condi clear for staff and for really the build in general. You can remove two conditions here, one here, one here, and then one here, kind of. Um, but this is this is the way to go. You can use it defensively as well as offensively. If you uh, start the fight off using your other weapon set then after you've blown these skills you can switch to four which is going to transfer all the conditions that you got on that push back into the enemy team and it's unblockable so there's nothing they can do to stop it other than if they're evading um, it transfers three conditions per target hit up to a total of fifteen possible um, and it's unblockable so again very difficult to avoid and it's a nice little blast finisher so any any fire fields that your group left in them or any water fields you get a little bit of healing a little bit of extra might out of it and Reaper's Mark, which is almost useless. Um, it's unblockable, which is great. It's five targets. Again, great big range, nice big radius, uh, but everybody runs stability or resistance, and that one second fear isn't going to do a whole lot against that. It's just going to be negated. What this is really useful for is after you do the initial push and the enemy uh, healers are catching up back to their front line, you can drop your, F or your Staff 4 and then Staff 5 into the healers, which will transfer all the conditions you receive from their damage dealers back into their support uh, group and you can probably get a fear into their support group as well which will break them up. It stops them from being able to heal, it stops them from being able to put more boons out. Uh, anybody who's getting res, this can be great to stop a res. Um, those, those are kind of your main uses for these two. These are the big skills on the staff. These are just kind of whatever. <music>set that you can use. Um, you can run it with axe torch or you can run it with scepter torch or um, axe or scepter with dagger. So I'll show you axe and torch right now and then dagger and scepter in a second. Uh, rending claws, just a filler. Um, it's nice for building up vulnerability on a lord because you can you can get your vulnerability up to 25 and keep it there the entire time with this build. Um, Ghastly Claws is great for attacking downs, as I'll show you in this next little clip, as well as giving you life force. Alright, Unholy Feast. This is the reason to take Axe over Scepter. Uh, it's a 600 radius, 2 boon convert. So whenever you're pushing into an enemy Zerg, or they're pushing into you, you convert 2 boons into conditions on everybody in their front line. Um, it can be blocked, but so long as you're attacking them while everybody else is attacking them, this is just great. Um, also, anybody who's low on health, it'll do a little bit of extra damage to, uh, as well as crippling them, which can make it easier for them to get knocked down by your revenants and your um, weavers. Torch 4, a uh, big damage skill. It's not as great now that they've increased the burning duration and decreased the stack. Same for the Torment. Um, but it is a nice 15% life force boost, and it's still a nice little boost of damage with burning and torment. Uh, great to fire into their back line. Oppressive Collapse is your Torch 5. Uh, this deals the torment damage to actually all of the targets in that radius. It's not just the one target. So if you fire this into an enemy group, it's going to hit five people, um, not just the one that you're targeting. And it'll give you might per condition uh, for everybody, all of your allies that are in that area. The knockdown only affects one person, though. So this is great if someone's running away or if you've got somebody who's positioned off. You can catch them with a Torch 5. It'll drop them to the ground, and if, it'll usually separate them from the Zerg for an easy down. Um, this is also great for if you're attacking the Lord. 
um, it allows you to build up 25 stacks of might on everybody around you or everybody who's near it. So here we have the scepter and dagger uh, offhand and you can you can use these in either combination either axe dagger or axe torch or scepter dagger or scepter torch. Um, the scepter has a nice auto attack, uh, it does a little bit of condition damage and it converts one boon to condition. Not super strong for zerg play because um, First of all, the damage is low. Secondly, it's only affecting one target, whereas you want to hit an AoE. This is an AoE, but it's only three stacks of bleeding, which is negligible. The only reason the damage is so high on this is because the duration is 14 seconds. You're never going to get 14 ticks off. That's just not going to happen with resistance and cleansing. Um, it's not viable. Uh, and the cripple is, again, kind of useless because you put out cripple on almost everything you do. So it's nice for tagging, but that's about it. Scepter 3, Feast of Corruption, great for single target DPS. Um, if you have somebody who's kind of singled out and off to the side, you can hit them with this and gain, they'll, they'll almost always have 5 conditions on them, so it's going to be gaining you 14.3% uh, life force, uh, as well as afflicting them with 6 stacks of torment at a fairly long duration. So if they try and run away, it'll do a ton of damage to them. Uh, Dagger 4 is nice, because this gives you a second condition clear. Uh, it bounces three times and transfers three conditions, so you can transfer a total of nine conditions with this if you fire it into the enemy Zerg. Um, it gives you a nice alternative to your set, uh, Staff 4, but whereas Staff 4 is unblockable, this can be blocked. Um, so that's, that's the downside to it. You have to know when to use it. Um, especially, it's, it's great, especially if you're firing it into a backline, just like with Staff 4. Dagger 5 uh, is going to give you, again, a really long duration bleed, um, which is mostly useless. That's great for tagging, but that's about it. Uh, the weakness can be nice, because that'll help if you hit their uh, revs with it. Um, that weakness will help to dump out some of their damage. They're going to do like half as much, and it's going to make it harder for them to dodge out of your bomb as well. But the nice part to it is the boons converted to conditions. It's an extra boon convert, um, which is kind of what you're running Scourge for. So running Dagger and Axe can allow you to drop uh, three boons converted into conditions in a very short time period. So if you open with your F1 and then F2, F4, you're going to convert one boon to condition 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And you can do that within like a three second span. You can convert almost all of their boons. Um, really cripples an enemy team, especially if they're going to be pushing on you. Alright, so your utility skill options here. Uh, for the heal, you want to run Sand Flare. That gives you a nice little self-heal. It converts a boon to a condition, uh, to two conditions on each affected target, but it's only a 240 radius, which is really small. Um, that barrier though, that 4k barrier, or if you're running Sally, it'll be more like 5k barrier, uh, is really nice because it affects five targets around you in that 240 radius as well as removing a condition from them. Um, plus if you're running Sadistic Searing you can use it to trigger Sadistic Searing on a push. Uh, everybody around you gets a little bit of extra buffer to stop from damage and you deal with a little bit more damage. The other options are going to be uh, Consume Conditions which is a longer cooldown and it has a much longer cast time which is kind of the bigger things. If you get stunned in the middle of it then you're dead you know. Um, but if you have a ton of conditions on you, this can clear all those conditions off and give you a sizable heal at the same time. Between the two of them, this is better for Zerg play, this is better for roaming, or if you're running in a very small group. Um, I'm going to skip Portal for now, because we're going to go into that later. Trail of Anguish. Um, this gives you swiftness and stability, and anybody who's following in your trail gets swiftness and stability. So the Necromancer only gets one stack of it upon activation, but anybody who's running in it can get two or even three of that. So that can really help, you know, if it'll, it'll put out 18 seconds of swiftness on everybody following you. And there's no target cap on it, so everyone can get it. Um, this is nice for, again, triggering Sadistic Searing. Um, it's a great stun break. It's on a low cooldown. And anybody who gets trapped inside of it, so if you're inside of the enemy Zerg and you use this, anybody who runs through that trail uh, of the enemy gets burned, they get a boon converted into a condition or into two conditions, uh, and they take a little bit of damage. Well of corruption. This is going to be really nice for 
uh, its unblockable fact, as well as for converting, converting boons into conditions in a group. You want to use this whenever you see an enemy Zerg that's grouped up and you can hit all five of them, and you don't think that they're going to be pushing right then, because otherwise they're going to run right out of it. But if you see them starting to pump might, or if they're starting to boon up, you can drop this in them and really fuck up that boon generation. Um, it does a little bit of damage as well, gives you a little bit of life force. The cooldown is a little bit long on it, but it's unblockable, has a low cast time. This is kind of a bread and butter world versus world necro skill. <laughs>
F1, F2, F4. Then the next time is going to be F1, F5. Um, by then you should have up F1, F2, F4 again. You want to rotate back and forth between those and save your F3. That way whenever you get into a, a shitty situation or someone's wailing on you, you can quickly get a little bit of barrier, a little bit of condi clear, give you a little bit of breathing room so you can jump back out of the fray and then you can come back into it again afterward. Um, if you don't think you're going to be attacked or if you're off off to the side so that the enemy can't hit you, then use F3 as well as F5. So it would be F1, F2, and 4, F1, F3, and 5. So that'll give you, you know, what is that, 5? Even even with a, uh, an offensive build, that's 7k barrier. So that'll help you in that secondary push, um, as well as giving you enough time to swap to staff. So usually F1, F2, F4. By then you'll be close enough to hit him with your Unholy Feast, followed by 4, swap to staff, F1, F3, F5. That'll give you enough barrier that those conditions that are ticking on you won't instantly kill you. Gives you time to use staff 4, followed by staff 5 into the enemy backline, clearing the conditions off of you and disrupting their healing. So, portal, um, subject of much debate. First I'll go through the mechanics of it, how it's used, and then we can do a couple of clips of the places it can be used at that you wouldn't expect, and a couple of clips of where it's been used to great effect. The skill itself has a 35 second cooldown base with sadistic searing, that cooldown drops to 28 seconds. Uh, it has a range of 900 and it uh, can transfer up to 20 people at a time. It also grants a barrier to everyone who passes through it, which makes it great for engaging, because when you engage with it, that means everybody who passes through it gets a couple of uh, extra KHP, a little buffer, uh, and a little extra might. So the range on it is out here. It isn't too bad, right? You can use that to skip forward. And how it looks is this big black and yellow spire on the ground. And you can use it to transfer back and forth uh, every other second. Um, it does tend to get its animation cold when it's used in a group, just because that's just how animations work, I guess, for the game. So the best ways to use it that we can, we can think of so far would be a uh, mark on the scourges that are going to be using it. And I think we should run three per group, uh, just to make sure that everyone gets through and that it's easy for everyone to get to. Uh, we can either put marks on the scourges and then once it's called for the scourges can count it down three two one fire away and you see the mark over the scourges head teleport run to where they teleported from and you'll pop up there. The other way we can do it is we can uh, have the commander put a mark on the ground and say we're going to portal from this mark. Have the scourges run up in front uh, and then portal from there into the enemy zerg, that way everyone knows where to go to, where the portal is going to come from, um, or at least as close to that spot as you can. So here's a couple of clips on where we can use it, um, and ways that we can use it effectively to avoid terrain. So portal works just like any other shadow step, which means anywhere that you can shadow step or blink to, you can also portal to. So anything with a ledge that leads up to it in an un unbroken path. So if you can walk up it without jumping, um, though some places are a little buggy and you'll get obstructions for no reason, you can portal to. Um, the exact limitations on it are just fucking weird, but let's see. So if we wanted to portal up here, the way you work, work is you get it right on that lip, and up you go. And you can do it all the way down here as well because you can walk to there from this ground. So you can also use it to skip over some hot spots uh, like on a bridge or on a choke point. Imagine if they're all sitting right up here and they're bombing here, right? So that's difficult for, for you to get anywhere close to them. It's difficult for you to get into them unless you're going to eat that whole bomb. With a portal, though, you can go 
on the outside of that bomb, drop it into them, and then just start fucking them up. Like, you can get right inside of them, and then if they start pushing back too hard, you just pop the portal back and get out. Um, after a little bit of practice, you can get that down to go pretty quick. So you can not portal down to here, because there's no way to walk up to this ledge uh, unless you go all the way around, and that's too far of a distance for it. However, going up the switchback, you can use it. You can use it both here to here and from here to here. Um, you have to make sure you're not hitting these ledges because it won't trigger, but see, up there, because these aren't ledges you can walk to now uh, in unbroken ground but you can use it to bump over this corner here or since this is a little bit easier I'll show you here providing I can walk straight you can skip that whole thing so if they're sitting up on top of here and bombing you and the only way to get up would be to climb around the sledge you can portal directly into them you skip that whole choke point so a lot of times if you're pushing on north of hills, you'll um, have the enemy sitting up on top of here. They'll be able to bomb down on you. So groups will stack up here and uh, boon up and get ready to push. So normally you have to go all the way around this, which means that you're walking all the way around that crenellation to get to them. Um, you can't portal to here. You can portal right here because that leads up onto this, but that has a big lip on it, so it's hard to jump up and over and slows you down. These spots aren't connected, so you can't portal to them. This one, however go right up and over and into them. Same thing for this little ledge right here. You can portal anywhere where those stairs are at. So if we look ahead here, you see another spot where it'd be, uh, you have to go all the way around in order to get your whole zerg up, which is going to slow you down, and if they're sitting up here, they can jump on top of you. With the portal, you can just go straight up and engage them. Punch right into them again. So here we have another useful spot. Um, I'm not even sure why this one works. Like, as you can see, there's not a good way to lead up to this or to walk to it, but for some reason, again, you can port there, you can blink there. Um, but if your whole group is down here, instead of having to push that bridge when they're all sitting on top of here and just, I mean, the weavers are going to be raining down on you, you could just run right down, port directly up and into their entire back line. Uh, the front line is going to be down here trying to hold the choke against you. So that's another place where it's super useful. Alright, so over in green side here, you have this rock, this ledge, right, where normally you put trebs up on, and to get to it, you've got to go all the way around if you're coming from the tower. However, with the portal, you can bring your whole zerg right up into the treb spot. Uh, this allows you to bypass all of the range damage, and you can just jump right into their asshole, pretty much. It's, it's really nasty for them. Same thing over here. You can get right up on top of it. You can skip the whole running around part. It saves a lot of time, lets you get into a much better place much quicker. Again, the same thing right here. The uh, Cata spot near Wild Creek, you can go right up and into them. You can't do it here because there's that lip in front. But over here, there is no lip. You can jump right up and into it. So you can see here, north of SMC, you have both of these cliffs, right? And there's a drop off on either side, but there's a nice gentle incline up to both of them. Um, so long as you're hitting the right ledge, you can go right up and over. So again, they, they can't bomb on you. You can just skip all that shit. You can do the same thing right here, um, because there's a nice ledge that leads up to it. You can do it from here up to here. So if someone's trubbing you, you can jump right up and into them. So notice how it's saying no valid path to target. You can't jump up to here because the water is in the way. You would have to swim all the way around and then walk up that side. Ooh. And the same thing for right here. If you try to get up to there, that's a ledge that you can't walk to. Um, so you can't portal to it. But you come up this way, and instead of giving them the advantage of the choke point, think right here. Yep, right up and over, right into their traps.